Fallout 3. Good old Oblivion with guns. Love it or hate it, you can't deny its impact. I mean, without it, we don't get New Vegas, so I gotta give credit where it's due. This game took the smelly, fly-infested, rotting corpse of the Fallout series, resurrected it, changed the core foundations of the series, redefined what a Fallout game even is, and catapulted the series back into mainstream relevance almost immediately. Which is extremely impressive, as changing a game from a classic-style isometric CRPG to a first-person shooter action RPG and actually sticking the landing isn't easy. And since I've already reviewed and ranked the DLCs for New Vegas and Fallout 4, I decided that it would be again cool and fun to take a look at the Fallout 3 DLCs and round out the modern Fallout trifecta. For this video, I'll be going in order of release again, except for Broken Steel, which I'll go over first, as it's the most unique out of the five DLCs released. Yes, I made a mistake in my Fallout 4 video when I said, well, Fallout 3 and New Vegas had four expansions each. Because I'd forgotten that Fallout 3 actually had five DLCs instead of four. Whoops! <laughs> but that aside, let's not waste any more air, and let's take a look at the first expansion, Broken Steel. DLC number one... Broken Steel... Broken Steel mostly exists as a fix for an issue of Fallout 3's. That being the fact that the player was unable to continue playing and exploring after the Activate Project period at the end of the main questline. As pre-Broken Steel, once you turn on the Purifier, your character assumedly dies from radiation exposure from the Purifier. But now, thanks to Broken Steel, instead of being reloaded back in front of the Purifier he just died in, you now wake up two weeks later in the Citadel's hospital. Quick side note though, Broken Steel only starts when you yourself turn the Purifier on. I tried to get Fox to say the classic line where he rejects you when you ask him to turn on the Purifier, and he cites Destiny as the reason he can't go in and turn it on despite him being a super mutant and fully immune to the deadly radiation blast the purifier shoots out. Curiously, it seems Fox's dialogue has in fact been updated, and he will now actually go into the purifier and turn it on when you ask it. He even takes a jab at the original line, saying that he would have fought it destiny, but since we changed his, he will do it for us. Even Bethesda knew how ridiculous that ending was. <laughs> but if you do that, that doesn't actually start broken steel, weirdly enough. Once Fox turns it on, the game just reloads you back at the purifier, so you can go in and turn it on the right way this time. Anyway, we wake up to Elder Lion's 4K Ultra HD wrinkles, and he tells us that we've been out cold for about two weeks, and that the purifier had been successfully turned on, with the Brotherhood of Steel hard at work handling bottling and distribution of the newly clean water. We also learn that even though we had spanked the Enclave at the Jefferson Memorial, they still pose a large threat to the wasteland, and need to be destroyed for good. Shit, they're still not done? Despite having their base blown up, their chat GPT powered president destroyed, their general dead, and a large number of their power armored soldiers and vertebrate fleet decimated in the battle for Project Purity. It seems they aren't ready to give up their water poisoning dreams quite yet, and Lyons tasks us with helping the Brotherhood put them down for good, awarding us knighthood for our efforts. Kind of a crappy reward, but at least he's acknowledging us. So we head out to find Scribe Rothschild to plan our next move. Rothschild gives us a sweet PowerPoint presentation of movements the Enclave has made while we are out cold. We learn that the Enclave, despite suffering a decapitating strike to its leadership and suffering two consecutive crushing defeats, their command hierarchy has remained intact and their communications are still in operation. Rothschild tells us that the transmissions have been tracked to a military base in the southwest and we are to go meet up with Paladin Tristan where we will assault the base of Liberty Prime from a collapsed car tunnel. After reaching the tunnel and linking up with the Brotherhood, we exit the tunnel to begin our assault on the base. For a game from 2008, this battle is pretty cinematic and bombastic, a lot like the assault on Project Purity from the end of the main questline. Liberty Prime leads the charge, lasering Enclave goons and chucking his nukes like footballs at them, all while spouting his pretty hilarious anti-communism lines. I've always been a big fan of Liberty Prime. He fits well into not only the technology of Fallout, but also the humor and satire of the series as well. And it's always funny to watch him call the Enclave communist and huck a football at them like a quarterback. Their play caller, Brian. But also like its Project Purity counterpart, this battle is much more spectacle than it is any actual engaging gameplay. Liberty Prime and the other Brotherhood of Steel soldiers make mincemeat out of the opposing Enclave soldiers real fast, and you the player can only usually get a handful of kills in before your allies completely obliterate them. But despite the assault going well, tragedy soon strikes. The Enclave call in an orbital strike on Liberty Prime, and in his last moments, Prime urges us to retreat from him before being destroyed in the orbital strike. He made the ultimate sacrifice and died as a true patriot. I salute you as a true American, Prime. As for why the Enclave didn't call in an orbital strike on Liberty Prime during the battle for Project Purity, or drop an orbital strike on the Citadel at any given time, I'm not sure. Maybe the strike would have been too powerful or something and it would have destroyed the Jefferson Memorial, or maybe they didn't get it working until after the battle for Project Purity or something. Whatever the reason, they really could have used it then is all I'm saying. 
But regardless, with Prime now gone, Tristan cracks the whip on us to go in the base and find out where they called in the orbital strike from. So we fight through a base full of Enclave troops, business as usual for Fallout 3, and retrieve data on the orbital strike from the base's mainframe, and return back to Rothschild to give him the data to examine. He tells us Lyons wants to speak with us again and is in disbelief that Liberty Prime has been destroyed, which I totally understand. I would be pissed if my epic patriotic mech got destroyed too. So we speak with Lyons, who's pretty shaken up by the loss of Liberty Prime, saying something along the lines of, It's over. Liberty Prime has fallen. Millions must give up the fight. But I reassure him that everything will be fine because I'm just a beast and an absolutely elite Enclave Slayer, and he tells me to go link up with Tristan for a new assignment. We speak to Tristan again, who assigns us a mission to go fetch a Tesla coil from the old only sewers to develop a new weapon with. It seems he's sending us on a late game combat skill check, as I'm pretty sure old only is the most dangerous area in the base game of Fall 3, as it's completely infested with death claws. So I make my way north to Olney, and after searching the place for the sewer entrance, for some reason the map marker got moved to a metro station I passed down in DC and didn't actually point to the actual entrance of the Olney Power Works, so I had to spend some extra time and resources fighting off death claws while I tried to find the entrance. I eventually find the entrance in an alley surrounded by dead bodies and miscellaneous flesh and gore and enter the sewers. The sewers are more of the same as on the surface. You're just killing more death claws, but now in a more confined space. Once we get through the sewers and chat up that guy from Twitter, we enter the only power works where we fight, you guessed it, more deathclaws. And this section is the most deathclawy of them all. I even had to bust out the fat man indoors to clean out a room that had three deathclaws loitering around in it. This DLC does not play on the late game combat. We continue on and fight some more Enclave soldiers and a squad of sentry bots until we reach the heart of the power works and find the Tesla coil in an electrified pit with some pretty cool looking lightning effects shooting out of it. We pick up the Tesla coil with our bare fucking hands, youch, and return to the Citadel. Tristan tells us they have tracked the Enclave to Adams Air Force Base and the only way to reach it is through the presidential metro station. He also takes the coil from us and tells us it'll be used to make a Tesla cannon, a new heavy weapon that melts enemies with an electric blast. I make my way to the tunnel, and along the way get ambushed by talent company thugs who want me dead for being too nice of a guy or something. Who the hell am I ops with here? Satan himself? But I quickly pack them up and then head off to the presidential metro. This metro station is another challenging combat area, full of turrets, tanky Mr. Gutsy robots, sentry bots, feral ghouls, and most dangerous of them all, the newly added feral ghoul reaver. Holy shit, the Reavers in Fallout 3 are jacked. They're spongier than Bob himself. Having a health pool on par with a Deathclaw, they can throw radioactive poop at you now for big damage, and they also hit like a truck. All that coupled with the extremely fast and jerky ghoul movements, and the relatively small hitboxes make this enemy a fucking nightmare to deal with. I fear these things more than actual Deathclaws. These bastards had also sucked me dry of stim packs, which at least for me were pretty weak at restoring health, even with a maxed out medicine stat and having the fast metabolism perk. One stim pack only restored about one fifth of my health, so I was hitting that pack pretty often. But thanks to my god tier gaming skills, and a little bit of shoddy programming, we take down the Reaver and hop on the train to the AAFB, complete with a train riding animation. Neat. I get off the train, fight a few more soldiers, and exit to Adams Air Force Base, which is a pretty sizable, impressive looking area. Although it's still pretty linear, as many areas are blocked off by Enclave force fields. The best comparison I can make is that it's pretty similar to Hopeville in Lonesome Road. I pilfer the supply cache that the Brotherhood had left me, which includes the newly built Tesla cannon, which is an absolute beast of a weapon. It fires a large electric blast that deals massive damage, and deals even more electricity damage over time. And it only uses one electron charge ammo per shot, and I had thousands of rounds shoved into my back pocket. And it's an absolute lifesaver for the Adams Air Force Base, as this area may be the longest and toughest battle in the entire game. The base is huge and infested with tough Enclave soldiers and turrets are peppered all over the buildings. The difficulty was compounded even more by the fact that I had burned through all my stim packs to get here, so that Tesla cannon is pretty much essential. But I forgot to use it. I was too caught up in trying to survive the first part of the base and didn't even whip that shit out until later in the quest. Probably would have saved me some time and deaths, but... Ah oh well, my bad. But once we take out or run by the Enclave troops, we enter their true base of operations, a fully functional base crawler. Impressive technology. Inside we fight some Sigma males and even more Enclave goons, and the crawler is a pretty large and labyrinthian building, and it's pretty visually interesting with contrasting blue and amber colors throughout the base. We also run into a guy named Stiggs, a mechanic employed by the Enclave. I'm pretty sure he's the only Enclave aligned NPC who doesn't immediately try to kill us on sight and we can actually talk to him to learn more about the facility. Unfortunately though, Stiggs doesn't really have anything interesting to say about the Enclave, nor can we learn any new info about them from him. 
and him being the only NPC in the Enclave we can actually talk to is pretty disappointing. This DLC had the potential to give us some interesting stories and characters from the Enclave, and maybe we could have learned more about the goals of the people in it. But since this is Bethesda, they usually prefer to stay in the shallow end of the lore pool. We don't even get a new Enclave commander to duel with or anything. The Enclave is apparently just Stiggs and 30,000 unnamed power armor clad soldiers. After talking with Stiggs, we head upstairs and clear out the area. This area being a pretty dense and interesting area to explore. I'd even gotten lost trying to open the door to the roof, and actually using the Tesla cannon made things go much smoother in combat. I eventually find my way and open the door and get on the roof, and even with the Tesla cannon, it was a pretty tough fight up here. Enclave troops drop in from vertebrates and attack you from all angles, and I was getting spanked a little bit. But I eventually make it through and enter the heart of the crawler base, where I access the mainframe and target the crawler with the orbital strike. At this point, you can either target the Enclave base or one of the Capital Wasteland settlements, which is essentially a do you want to be good or evil choice, as all the settlements available for targeting are friendly settlements, so the choice is pretty shallow. It's a more binary version of the Helios 1 quest in Fallout New Vegas. And we escape the base where a now conscious Sarah Lyons picks us up for a sweet vertebrae ride. We land away from the base and watch it get hammered by the orbital strike in a bombastic display. And with that, we take another vertebrate ride back to the Citadel and complete Broken Steel. I feel like Broken Steel is a pretty good atomization of Fallout 3 at large. It has tight, engaging combat that feels pretty intense and challenging, and has some pretty great spectacle to it. Battling alongside Liberty Prime, fighting through the massive Adams Air Force Base and Enclave Crawler, and watching it blown to Kingdom Come via Orbital Strike was pretty impressive for a 2008 game. But besides the engaging combat and the spectacle, Broken Steel falls pretty flat in pretty much all other aspects. The story builds off of the not great Fall 3 main quest line, which means the issues from that story translate here. The Enclave are still just one dimensional bad guys, and the only non openly hostile NPC from the faction being Stiggs was pretty disappointing. Broken Seal could have gone a long way in giving the Enclave and its soldiers some more depth and lore. I mean, this is their last hurrah, but they're just here to take another spanking in the end. Even the Brotherhood aren't even that interesting. Owen Lyons just sits in the Citadel feeling anxious all day. Sarah Lyons only shows up at the very end to save us and report that she isn't in fact dead, and Pallet and Tristan just exist to bark orders at us. This expansion also doesn't do too much outside of being an endgame combat gauntlet. All the missions require you to mow down dozens of enemies and there are almost no choices or roleplaying opportunities to make. It plays more like Fallout of Duty 3 instead of an actual Fallout game, if that makes sense. But with that, we can move on to the next expansion. Operation Anchorage. DLC number two, we got Ops in Anchorage. Operation Anchorage starts when you listen in on the Brotherhood Outcast distress signal, which is requesting support on their location. The Brotherhood Outcasts are a faction added in this DLC, an offshoot of the Brotherhood of Steel that became disillusioned with Elder Lions and his chapter, as they believed his decision to focus on protecting local wastelanders and killing mutants, rather than being focused on securing pre-war technology and being more like their western counterparts, would destroy the Brotherhood and goes against their entire reason for existing. These fans weren't happy with the Brotherhood's role changing from an insular, cult-like group of soldiers and scientists who hoard old technology to further their own research and goals, to a sort of benevolent police of the capital wasteland that's an almost holy good and righteous faction. Which were very fair criticisms, as it watered down Fallout 3's Brotherhood to being unambiguous good guys who exist solely to help the player. A far departure from Fallout 1 and 2's Brotherhood, as when you try to join the Brotherhood in Fallout 1, they send you to go die in a massive cancer hole. Regardless, we meet up with the source of the transmission, an outcast paladin named Merrill. He begrudgingly allows us to tag along, and we fight through some cheese mutants until we reach their outpost. Morel sees that we have a pit boy on our wrist that can interface with a simulation pod they found, yet we're unable to operate due to a lack of a compatible interface with the pod, until we stroll in with a pit boy on our wrist. But that begs the question, could the outcast not find one working pit boy Are they that rare? That's a whole can of lore worms we can't get into right now though. So anyway, we meet with the outcasts, who are all pricks to us. Protector McGraw gives us a rundown on the Anchorage simulation, and tells us that if we complete it, it'll unlock a weapons cache. Now properly motivated, we put on our simulation jammies and enter the Anchorage simulation, starting the DLC in earnest. Operation Anchorage on the surface is a super cool concept. The Battle of Anchorage is probably the most important conflict before the Great War started, so it's super dope to see it in action. But, since this is a simulation, things are pretty different from the normal game. Enemies now phase out of existence when killed, and they cannot be looted. You can only loot weapons placed in the world that glow a pulsating red and make a droning sound like neuron roots when close, with only a select number of weapons available for use. Those being the 10mm pistol and SMG, the assault rifle, both normal and Chinese type, the missile launcher, the sniper rifle, the Gauss rifle, and that's about it. 
The same goes for health and ammo, which can be replenished at health and ammo receptacles. The mechanics of Fallout 3 have been completely stripped back to make way for a completely combat-focused expansion. This is some real Fallout of Duty 3 gameplay. It's a very interesting choice for Bethesda to make a DLC that's carried by the gunplay and shooting mechanics of Fallout 3. And the results can be pretty airy. The story for this DLC is practically non-existent as you're just going through various battle scenarios while getting orders barked at you. The first section of this DLC is pretty visually interesting though. You fight along large snowy cliffs and canyons fighting Chinese soldiers and fighting through cliffside bases and caverns. Our first goal is to destroy the large artillery guns located at the top of the cliffs, and destroying them is pretty straightforward. Just walk to the back of the gun, interact with the large glowing box on the back of it to strap a bomb to it, and stand back until it blows up. Rinse and repeat two more times, and uh, don't stand too close all the while fighting 10,000 faceless Chinese soldier NPCs. The Chinese soldiers come in two forms, a more generic soldier and a stealth suit equipped soldier. The stealth suits look really dope and allow the wearer to turn invisible, which usually just makes the combat more annoying than anything, because the ripple from the invisibility is still easy enough to see and shoot at, but the enemies can't be targeted in vats when invisible, so you just gotta spray at them with Fallout 3's dubious hit detection. Once those artillery guns are cooked, the game teleports you out of the cliffs to General Chase's camp, where he briefs you on the next step of your mission. We have to destroy a listening post, a tank depot, and disable a minefield so we can reach the oil refinery the Chinese are using as a base. We also unlock the ability to request loadouts and squads to help us in this mission, which is done through a clunky ass terminal. The squad building was touted as one of the primary features of the DLC, but in practice it's just a pretty simple mechanic that lets you select which friendly NPCs will team up with you in battle. You get 5 points to spend on allies, who cost 1 to 4 points to recruit. I recruited a 4 point sentry bot to help me take on the listening post, where he promptly got blown the fuck up. <laughs> Damn. That's kind of a good representation of the squad system in this DLC. At best it'll provide a bit of extra firepower, but you're still gonna be mostly doing the heavy lifting yourself. Also, besides picking your squad and telling them where to go via dialogue, you don't have any other extra control over them. Plus, the only squad mate I really need is Ben Montgomery here. He's essential and won't get killed. He's the perfect soldier. These next missions are more of the same as before, with the only difference being the difficulty, which takes a solid jump, as the enemies are more numerous and have much more range on you, and your health is going to get chewed up a lot by snipers, with limited range options to counter them. You have to take some hit points closing in the gap to kill them. We continue playing Fallout of Duty. We destroy the listening post and Chimera tank depot, even fighting one of the Chimera tanks, which are funny looking snow tanks that move with corkscrew cylinders instead of treads. Once those are destroyed, we can link up with a squad of power armored soldiers and there's a cool little moment where a reporter takes a picture of some posing marines. That picture being the origin of the Anchorage Memorial statue we find in the base game, which is a cool little touch. We then disable the mine pulse field, which conveniently is deactivated from our side of the minefield, and we assault the oil refinery. After we enter, we're locked in place and watch General Jing Wei flashily execute a soldier with his sword, then he turns to us. If you pass the speech check, you can convince him to commit suicide with just one sentence, which is pretty damn hilarious. But I failed that check and had to duke it out with him. From this fight, I can assume Jing Wei was given the title of general for his incredible resistance to bullets. Even several Gauss rifle blasts to the face doesn't phase this guy. I had actually run out of ammo fighting him and had to blast his kneecaps off with a missile launcher to take him down for good. This interaction with Jing Wei is the only real time the simulation aspect of the DLC is used in a fun way. Jing Wei's over-the-top dialogue and the ability to have him stab himself with just one line is pretty funny, and it fits perfectly with what propaganda the US would have put in the simulation. Outside of this instance though, the simulation only really exists to justify the more constricted mechanics of this DLC. Even just having the generic Chinese soldiers say crazier things would have gone a long way for this DLC. But regardless, when Jing Wei dies, General Chase appears before us to announce the end of the simulation, and we jack out of it. With the simulation complete, we can now open the armory to get the real prize of this DLC, a sweet suit of winterized T-51B power armor. On top of just being a sweet looking suit, its condition also never seems to go down, and in a game where armor condition decays pretty quickly, this thing is a god tier item. Once we have pilfered the reward room, two of the outcasts, Sibley and McGraw begin arguing, and eventually open fire on each other, which surprised me as I was walking by and NPCs just started popping off at each other. After killing the mutineers, the only NPC left alive was that rude ass specialist Olin, so I blasted her ears off to keep things consistent. After saying bye to Marill on the way out, Operation Anchorage is now complete. Overall, Operation Anchorage is a pretty weak package. It plays like a mid-mission in a mid-Call of Duty game. There's even 10 collectible Intel briefcases you can pick up throughout it. Fallout of Duty is in full control here. 
So unless you really enjoy Fallout 3's combat, do they even make those kinds of people? You won't get much of anything out of this DLC. Outside of the interesting concept and location, as well as the winterized T-51B power armor reward in a cool few moments, you'd have a much better time just playing the cliffhanger mission from Modern Warfare 2. The story is basic to downright non-existent, and stripping back Fallout 3's base mechanics to make a more streamlined shooter experience does way more harm for the game than good. But with that, we can move on to a more meaty expansion, The Pit. DLC number 3, The Pit. The Pit takes us out of the green-tinted diarrhea landscape of the Capital Wasteland to the orange-tinted diarrhea ruins of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. To get there, we need to follow another radio signal, classic, and meet up with a guy named Werner. Werner tells us he's an escaped slave from a place called The Pit, and that he needs an outsider's help in freeing the slaves from their raider overlords. He tells us to go to a nearby slaver camp to get a slave outfit that we could use to sneak into The Pit with. So I go there, and when I get there, the slavers recognize me as the guy who shot up Paradise Falls which I indeed did, and attacked me on sight, which was a nice little detail. I kill the slavers, get a slave outfit, and Werner jump scares me, saying he followed me here. With disguise in hand, we return to the tunnel and make our way towards the pit. Now's a good time to go over the lore and the background of the pit. Like I mentioned, the pit is the ruins of Pittsburgh, a city known for its metalworking and steel industry. The pit was not only heavily bombarded with nukes during the Great War, but the pre-existing pollution from the steel production facilities mixed with the radiation to make the pit an absolute biohazard of a city. This extreme pollution casts a brownish-orange smog over the entire city, and prolonged exposure to the pollution in the city, coupled with almost 200 years of no Steelers football, has caused the pit's inhabitants to develop troglodyte degeneration contagion, a mysterious disease that causes people to lose their minds and denigrate into impish mutant creatures known as trogs short for troglodyte, that infest the city like rats and attack the humans who haven't devolved yet. The city is also full of wild men, people whose minds have been destroyed and rotted by the pollution in the TDC, and attack you on sight. 30 years before the pit takes place, the pit was a chaotic hellhole, and the Brotherhood of Steel when passing through it, was so disgusted by the violence and hopelessness of the place, decided to do a little ethnic cleansing. Total Yinzer death. Owen Lyons must have been a Ravens fan or something and they swept through the city in one night, killing anything and anyone that was hostile, or could be hostile. Their only loss was an initiate named Asher, who had been left behind after he had gotten caught in a collapsing building and was assumed dead. When we enter the pit, we learn that Asher had survived the collapse, and over the last 30 years had built up a society of raiders and slaves to run the pit, as the pit still contained a steel factory that was still in operation, allowing for the manufacturing of weapons, bullets, and armors, a massive prize in a post-nuclear world. And when we arrive, Asher has an iron grip on the city, but he also may have a cure for the troglodyte degeneration contagion, which would be a game changer for the pit and its denizens. When we reach the pit, we fight off a few raiders and wild men, and we approach the bridge that connects to the city, and the pit makes a great first impression. The ruins of Pittsburgh look awesome, the orangish brown tint gives the place a real nasty and industrial vibe, and the wrecked bridge full of cars that were desperately trying to escape the city and strung up corpses and jerry-rigged metal scaffolding make for an awesome entrance. This DLC is great at feeling filthy. The air looks polluted and heavy, all the NPCs from the pit have dirty, cracked, and peeling faces, and Bethesda did a really good job with the presentation of this place, and it still stands out from other Fallout series locations to this day. I pull up to the pit's front gate in full power armor, disregarding Werner's slave disguise plan completely. <laughs> Sorry bro. I enter the front gate and get whacked with metal sticks until I'm unconscious, and get enslaved anyway. I mean my power armor should have been able to fend off these lowly raiders, but since I'm just such a class act, I let them beat me up so I could beat them at their own game. We're woken up by Medea, Werner's contact and fellow slave. We follow her to her house, and she tells us she has a plan to get us in front of Asher, and that a revolt has been brewing for a while but we can't make a move on him yet. So Medea sends us out to collect steel ingots from the steel yard to help us blend in. So we head to the steel yard and do a quick walkthrough of the steel factory, which despite running like complete crap on my 3070 Ti GPU, is a pretty cool place. Molten steel buckets move overhead and flames and sparks fly out of steel cutting machines. It looks pretty dope. We talk to the steel yard doorman who's just jazzed about our upcoming death by troglodyte. We enter the steel yard and begin our search. The Steelyard is where most of the actual gameplay of the pit occurs outside of the last quest. The Steelyard is a very large, explorable area that introduces us to the aforementioned Trogs, where we catch glimpses of them when we enter, building some pretty solid tension. Once inside the Steelyard, we see a slave trying to get a Trog's attention behind a fence. John John here tries to get the Trog to recognize him as his brother, but Trog don't care, and attacks and kills him, and I kill the Trog in return. 
The Trogs are pretty simple enemies, just running up and swiping at you to deal damage, but they're pretty numerous. Sometimes I had to fight like four or five of them at a time. And fighting them in the Steelyard felt like a balanced challenge that's not only about combat, but also about resource management, as all your items were taken from you when you got enslaved. I collect my 10 ingots exactly and return to the factory. There's 100 total ingots to collect in the yard, so you can really comb and pilfer the place real deep if you want for some extra rewards. But you got me fucked up if you think I'm doing another tedious collect-a-thon. I got my fill on that from Nuka World. We return with the ingots and we head back to Medea's house, where she tells us Asher is gathering people in the town square to announce the opening of the arena, a fighting pit for slaves where a slave can be freed if they defeat the gladiators of the arena. Not only that, but the winner also gets to meet with Asher in person at his base. Medea tasks us with winning the arena so we can get to Asher and steal his supposed cure. We exit her house and listen to Asher's speech. His speech seemed glitch for me though, and it sounded like he was simultaneously giving a different, but quieter speech. Victories in the struggle for freedom! Because yes, freedom is what we all work so, towards! To celebrate this struggle, I ask my loyal workers, who among you is prepared to fight for your- not sure what that was about. Asher boasts about the future prosperity of the pit that's definitely coming, guys, trust me, and asks if anyone wants to fight in the arena for their freedom. Medea volunteers us, and we head down to the arena to throw down. The arena, also known as the crassly named The Hole, is a pretty short section of the DLC, involving three fights with some well-equipped, but pretty weak enemies. The last fight being a one-on-one -on -one fight with some goober named Gruber, and from his corpse we can pick up a DLC unique weapon a suppressed and scoped MP5 called the Infiltrator. It looks pretty sweet, but the weapon itself is kind of disappointing, essentially just being a weaker Chinese assault rifle. But with the arena fights cleared, we can finally get our gear back and access the Raider-only uptown areas and Asher's base of operations, a large skyscraper called Haven. Right outside of Haven is a creepy as fuck statue of a tall, thin, chained down humanoid figure that's in a pretty painful looking stance with flames billowing out next to it. This brutal art piece isn't exactly helping their image as misunderstood leaders with a vision for the pit's future. We enter and walk up to Asher's desk, where he's currently chatting with one of his lieutenants. Asher corrects his goon when he calls the slaves, slaves, instead calling them workers, which he hopes will boost slave morale and reduce hopelessness. <laughs> Once he's done talking to his underling, we can finally speak to the architect of Pitt's misery himself. We talk to Asher, who tells us he may have a cure for radiation, and reveals to us that Werner isn't all who he seemed. Werner wasn't a slave, but rather Asher's old right-hand man, and had tried to oust Asher, failed, got enslaved, came up with a plan for a revolt with Medea, and escaped the pit, where he then got in contact with us. But before we can speak about this any further, Asher gets a phone call that the slaves have begun revolting, and he scurries off to handle the situation, leaving us free to grab the cure. We enter Asher's lab, and we find something unexpected. A cleanly dressed woman whose face is absolutely filthy. This is Asher's wife, Sandra, and the cure isn't any type of vaccine or medicine, it's actually a baby. The baby, whose name is Marie, apparently not only has a natural immunity to TDC, but also has immunity to all negative effects of radiation. How convenient! Although baby Marie is a promising start towards a cure for TDC, she's still a baby and must be experimented on very carefully, and due to this, cure development has been a slow go. It's here we can make our big choice for the DLC, leave the baby or take her. Sadly, you cannot eat the baby. That was a meme. The pit tries to make this decision as morally gray as possible, but in the end, I find the choice is still either just fairly good or fairly bad, instead of just the wholly good or wholly bad options the game usually throws at you. On one hand, if you take the baby and side with the slaves, Asher and his raiders are wiped out and the slaves are freed. Sure, Werner's dishonesty and true motives aren't good and he isn't trustworthy, but siding with him still puts a hard stop on slavery in the pit and wipes out the thuggish and oppressive raiders. But that leaves the pit's future uncertain, and pretty much solely pinned on a successful cure being developed, which may be harder for slaves to pull off than a scientist. Whereas if you leave the baby and side with Asher, the cure's development is more likely to be successful, but you maintain the pit's brutal slavery system that may never actually end. I decided to take the baby, as I still find it evil to maintain a system of slavery, no matter the circumstances. And even though the system that held pit society together would end, it's still better overall for the slaves to have the freedom to try and survive their new city, instead of living and dying in brutal slavery where they'll eventually turn into a pot-bellied imp from years of breathing in HPV gas at your slave job. And since the story of the pit never gets an end slide section that tells you how the player's actions affected the future of the world and characters, this is all just speculation. And I think it's safe to say no slavery is better than having slavery, even if a baby needs to get kidnapped for it to end. 
I also found it disappointing how little we can actually talk to Asher and Werner, as Asher only gives some broad justifications to his slave society before he runs off. Also, these raiders are pricks, and I wanted to shoot their heads clean off their necks. So I swipe the baby, double tap Asher's wife, and fight my way out of Haven. We get outside, and raiders and slaves are fighting in the streets. We have to make our way back to Medea. I fight through the streets of the pit, dropping raiders and frames left and right, and I make it to the steel factory, where Medea tells me to go link up with Werner in his hideout in the steel yard. I give Werner the baby, and he reveals the last step in his plan, cutting the lights to Haven and Uptown so the Trogs can overrun it, as they apparently have an aversion to light. So we fight through some sewers and cap some Trogs, cut the power, and exit out in front of Haven, where Asher just happens to be loitering around. I chase him down and kill him for his clothes and make my escape, getting chased by a huge pack of Steelers fans. Don't mention what Ben Roethlisberger did in that bathroom in Pittsburgh. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I'm serious. Get ready to dash because there's a ton of these motherfuckers and they can move really fast. But I escape into the steel factory and head back to the downtown area. Werner catches up with me in the middle of a firefight and congratulates us for being the best errand boy ever. He gives us some rad cures that they got from baby experimentation and opens up the steel forge to be used to make ammo. A pretty sweet reward. And with that, the pit is complete. Overall, the pit is a very solid yet brief DLC package. The location of the pit has a great design and tone. You can really feel the filth and hopelessness oozing from this place. And there are some pretty great visual moments in dense areas. It's incredibly immersive and intriguing, and most of the locations kept me interested in wanting to learn more. My issues with this DLC stem from how surprisingly brief it is. You could probably complete the whole story in under an hour if you know what you're doing. And the segmented design of the pit works well for what it sets out to do. But I feel like if it was an open, contiguous space, it would have been even better to give cohesion to the world and open up new opportunities to learn more about each faction. The conflict between the raiders and slaves is an interesting concept on paper, and the lore and circumstances of the pit are genuinely interesting. If they had dug more into it, such as more dialogue with NPCs like Asher and Werner, and maybe more side content from both factions to get a better idea of their motives and situations, we could be looking at a top 5 Fallout DLC here. But as it stands, like the rest of Fallout 3, the narrative and choices remain pretty surface level, with the main decision being be bad to bring good, which may eventually become bad, or be good to continue bad, but bad may turn into good. But we never get any resolutions on those ends, so it remains just an exercise in speculation. I also had some pretty rough performance issues, especially at the final battle slash slave revolt. I'm not sure why it ran so poorly, but it probably boils down to Fall 3's PC port being some dog ass and just how old the game is. I remember all that Games for Windows Live shit. But with that complete, it's time to move on to the fourth DLC. Point Lookout. DLC number four, Point Lookout. Our fourth DLC, Point Lookout, starts when you approach the new Riverboat Landing location. When you arrive, you're approached by a woman named Catherine, who pleads with us to find her daughter Nadine, who had sailed to Point Lookout on the riverboat we're currently standing in front of. We talk to Tobar, the boat driver, and he tells us more about Point Lookout, trying to sell us on a trip to Point Lookout like a shyster salesman, which I'll get back to. We buy a ticket off of him for 360 caps, damn scalper. We hop on the cot and sail to Point Lookout. We then cut to the boat sailing into Point Lookout. Twangy, ominous music plays as we dock at the abandoned boardwalk, a green fog settling over the flat and wet landscape. It's a pretty great tone setter for this DLC, really setting up the mysterious and swampland vibes pretty well. We dock and talk to Tobar again, who notices smoke rising up from the Culvert Mansion, pointing us toward the main quest of the DLC like a beacon, literally. Once we got the spiel on the place from Tobar, we can strike out to begin the DLC in earnest. Point Lookout is the first, and only, Fall 3 DLC that adds a new, completely open and contiguous area to explore. The titular ruins of Point Lookout State Park, located southeast of Washington, D.C., jutting out into the Chesapeake Bay, and is loosely based off of the real-world Point Lookout State Park. Point Lookout's map is split into two main sections, the coastal beaches and cliffs, and the interior swamplands, which are inhabited by mutated, inbred, cannibal swamp hicks, and a local unnamed tribe that worship the native punga fruit and its psychotropic effects it has when consumed. Along with these guys are your typical Fallout enemy fair, feral ghouls and mirelurks, which are now called swamplurks for the theme. The beaches aren't super interesting outside of the locations on it, like the cathedral, mansion, and boardwalk, but the swamps have the creepiness factor jacked all the way up to 11, Beyond just the killer mutant inbreds that roam the swamps, creepy dolls can be seen hanging from trees, totems with severed heads and skulls are dotted all over the place, and the trees are dead, spindly, and twisted, and there's this constant bluish darkness that just hangs over the swamp at all times. The creepiness can be a little overdone at times, especially with the lynched baby girl dolls everywhere, 
but overall it works really well to create an atmosphere that's pretty unique for the fall universe. Who could forget such epic locations such as truck wreckage, and trash heap, and grower's shack. And that's coupled with the crisp sound design. The swamp sounds of frogs, crickets, and other bugs chattering and croaking in the background sound pretty on point and do a lot for immersion and atmosphere when in the swamp areas of the map. Now that we have the lay of the land, let's go check out that commotion at the mansion. When we arrive at the mansion, a ghoul's voice, although quiet, can be heard asking us for help fighting off a group of local tribals that are attacking the mansion. Never one to pass on an opportunity to slaughter dozens of unwashed barbarians, we swoop in and join the fight. This first battle at the mansion is a pretty long one, tasking us with sweeping through both wings and all floors in the mansion, and fighting off several waves of these tribals, who seem to have odd scars all over their heads and bodies. I found this fight to be pretty engaging. Despite only wearing loose sackcloth robes and wielding rudimentary weapons, these tribals are pretty tough and can eat a few bullets, and some are equipped with some heavy hitting weapons, like the DLC added lever action rifle and the double barreled shotgun, and there's a ton of them, so you'd best be prepared for the scrap. I also really like how sometimes they'll ragdoll through barriers and bust in through doors. It's pretty funny to watch. I mow through these guys, collapse their entry points, fall through three floors, and return to the main foyer where we make a final stand to the ghoul we talked to earlier, Desmond. The tribals break through the main foyer doors just to be cooked by me and Desmond, and once they're all dead, we can finally speak to him. Desmond barely thanks us because he's an absolute prick. His dialogue is pretty funny. When you ask him questions about Point Lookout, he'll either dismiss your question by saying we wouldn't understand what's going on, or insults the thing we're asking you about in a profanity-laden rant. Desmond has one of the best characterizations in all of Fallout 3, and he's pretty entertaining as an unabashed asshole who probably curses the most out of any other Fall character. I think Bro drops more fuck bombs than there are in the entire base game. Also, for a ghoul, he's got a sweet cut and mustache. Bro has not been slacking on the conditioner. Despite his standoffishness towards us, the guy who just slaughtered two dozen tribal goons to save his life, solely out of the kindness of our hearts. Desmond probably needs us more than he's letting on, so he tasks us with infiltrating the tribals and figuring out why they want him in a box. So we head to the base of their operations, the Ark and Dove Cathedral. When we arrive at the cathedral, we are told via intercom that we won't be let in unless we complete something called the Mother Seed Ritual. So we trek and battle through the spooky ass swamp until we reach the ritual site. We fight some more through the ritual site, killing several swamp lurks along the way, until we reach a massive punga fruit. The punga fruit farts in our face, and we pass out from huffing that shit in. After getting back up, we start geeking real hard, and as you trek back, bobbleheads of special skills start popping up in the swamp with doomer messages. They must have gone on Twitter for five minutes or something. We also see this weird gesticulating red blob thing, inverted landscapes, giant needles and threads sewing up the ground, and a hallucination of our dead mother, and when we interact with it, it says, Black, if my kid looked like that, I'd have been in it too. Jesus Christ, this punk of fruit is fucking savage. We then see dead bodies of NPCs we met in the base game rise up from the swamp, until we reach what appears to be Mr. Burke and the Megaton Nuke. The bomb explodes and we wake up from our geek session. The hallucination sequence is short but effective, and it always gave me the heebie-jeebies as a kid when I played Fallout 3 on my now petrified Xbox 360. After waking up, we return to the cathedral and we are finally let in. We're greeted by the doorman Jimson, where we can get some more info about the tribe and its beliefs, which are pretty vague and surface level. All we really know about them is that they eat punga fruit to trip balls off of, and worship its hallucinogenic and healing effects. They also practice brain excision, and during the ritual we had our skull cracked open and a small part of our brain cut out, which the tribe believe expands the mind. We also learn that they have a leader simply known as Jackson, but he's not at home right now, and besides that, we don't really know much. The rest of what we can glean is essentially just vague ramblings about mind expansion in the astral plane, nothing solid we can really understand or get examples of, which is unfortunate, as it makes the tribe pretty shallow. Hell, they don't even have a name, they're just known as the Tribals, parentheses point lookout on the fallout wiki. From Jimson we also get more info on why the tribals attack the mansion, telling us that Jackson had ordered the attack, but for reasons we do not know yet. So we head inside the cathedral, where we can see some tribals plug walking around the cathedral off that punga goop, and we run into the girl we've been looking for, Nadine, who is seemingly shacked up with this tweaker tribe. Nadine tells us about how our skull has been cut into and a part of our brain has been nicked, leaving us with a nasty scar on our forehead. But not to worry, Nadine can remove the scar for us. It's always funny to see scar removed pop up, like a bodily injury is just a part of my inventory. We ask Nadine about Jackson's whereabouts, who tells us he's off in his magic prayer cave that only he can access. But luckily for us, 
Nadine had gotten a head start on her homework and had followed Jackson to his lair and gives us the key to access it through a wreck ship at the bottom of the cathedral's cliffs. How convenient. She also tells us to meet her at the boardwalk later to investigate who took our brain bits during the geek session. With this info in hand, we return to Desmond to report what we found. Desmond then promptly kicks us out to go find Jackson and berates me for wasting his time. <laughs> Sorry bro, I'm just following the quest marker. So we do a 180 and head back to the cathedral, but not before Desmond flexes his age and experience on us. Such a funny guy. So I head into Jackson's sea cave using Nadine's key, and after a short scrap with some more swamp lurks, we can finally approach Jackson, who is gesticulating and tweaking while speaking to a projection of a brain through an odd device. From their conversation, we learn that the brain wants Desmond dead and a jammer destroyed so the brain can perform some, quote, psychic domination. All the while, Jackson wholly misinterprets the brain's commands as some sort of astral plane domination plan. By talking to Jackson, we learn that he leads the tribals by taking orders from the brain hologram, believing these commands to be holy steps to enter the astral plane. Or something. It's kind of vague. Jackson is kind of stupid, and he's completely oblivious to what's actually going on and what the brain wants. The brain insults him to his face and rebukes his ideas that any of this has to do with an astral plane. So we speak to the brain to get the actual full picture. We ask him why he wants Desmond dead, and he, like Desmond, just shuts us down and tells us that we couldn't possibly understand his reasonings. And that all we need to know is that we need to destroy a jammer Desmond is using to block the brain's signals. Which is preventing him from psychologically dominating all the locals using some sort of brain radio science method. Again, it's kind of vague. But we also learn that the brain and Desmond have a history together. So we return to Desmond to learn the truth. We return to Desmond, who seemingly has already gotten a brief on what happened in the cave. We also learn that the brain belongs to his old rival, Professor Calvert, a member of an influential pre-war family of the same name, who had survived the last 200 years as a disembodied brain in a tank, and Desmond had come to Point Lookout in search of him. Desmond then tasks us with jamming Calvert's broadcast by planting a jammer on the ferris wheel in the boardwalk. When we arrive at the ferris wheel, we get a message from Calvert directly into our brains telling us to side with him and to destroy the jammer. It's here that we can make our Fall 3 patented this or that choice, and I usually almost always side with Desmond, as even though he's a dick, there's no real reason to side with Calvert at all, as he seems just wholly evil and has some insane ass plans to psychically dominate the surrounding area. And Calvert is just as big of a prick as Desmond is, so the only reason I could see for siding with Calvert is if you just want to be evil. So we go ahead and plant the jammer, and Calvert six his tribal shooters on us, who we dispatch in a pretty cool boardwalk firefight. As we return to Desmond, the mansion gets blown up in a massive explosion that throws our player back, and we enter the safe room as debris from the explosion falls all around us. It's a pretty cool little detail. I'm not sure how Calvert triggered the failsafe explosion though. Maybe he used his psychic powers like a Pokemon to sidebeam the failsafe on or something. We speak to Desmond in the safe room, who had tracked Calvert's location to underneath the Point Lookout lighthouse. Desmond is pissed and fiending to smoke that Calvert pack, so we head right on over. In the lighthouse, we enter through a hidden hatch into an underground lab facility. From terminal entries inside, we can learn that this place was a facility that was doing R&D on RoboBrain and brain extraction and preservation technology. Until it was taken over by the Calvert family, where Professor Calvert eventually got his brain put into a tank and preserved. After a brief trip through the facility, we come face to face with Calvert's brain. Here we can make one last choice to side with Calvert or Desmond just by opening fire on the one we don't want to side with. Desmond will even wait patiently for you to make your choice instead of immediately just trying to kill Calvert like you think he would. They just stand there insulting each other back and forth until you make a move. <laughs> I make the same choice again. Calvert didn't add any extra benefits or sound reasoning to join his side, even with his back completely against the wall. And when I ask for more info, he just dismisses me again and tells me I'm too stupid to understand their rivalry or something. Like, alright, whatever, bro. So I just smash his tank, and his brain plops onto the floor, vanquished. Desmond revels in his victory, and reveals what he was really after, Calvert's research. Well, I th at least I think. He again tells us we're too dumb to understand what he actually wants, and tells us to fuck off. And with that, we pilfer the vault at the end of the facility, and that completes the main quest for Point Lookout. Despite some good characterization and some pretty entertaining quests, the main story of Point Lookout still feels like a missed opportunity. The setup of a story of two longtime rivals who had survived the Great War, one through brain extraction and one through ghoulification, has a lot of potential to have a sort of post-war political intrigue slash special operations story, but it feels mostly shallow as Desmond and Calvert refuse to actually talk specifically about why they actually hate each other and will shut you down or dismiss you by saying something like, bah, you wouldn't understand the situation anyway, shit like that. 
It just feels cheap and leaves the conflict at the heart of the story feeling shallow. Desmond is a selfish asshole, but all he really wants is Calvert's stuff. And Calvert is an actual mad scientist who wants to mind control people with psionic waves or something. It's not the most riveting stuff. But overall, the missions do a lot of work in making the main story fun and interesting throughout the missions and gameplay, even if the story is a bit underdeveloped. But that's not all to Point Lookout, as it has a handful of side quests, most notably the Black Hall Manor quest and the Chinese Spy quest. The Black Hall Manor quest begins when you arrive at the Swamp Mansion of the same name. Inside we find a lone old man living in it, Obadiah Blackhall, who requests our help in retrieving a lost family book. He says the local Swamp Men have taken the book to a ritual site past the boardwalk, and offers us a rack of caps to get it back. Help this suspicious old man alone in a scary Swamp Manor find a book in a place called a Ritual Site? Sounds legit. I'm in. When we leave the manor, we're greeted by a woman named Marcella, who warns us against giving Obadiah the book, and tells us the book is called the Krivbekne, and that the Blackhalls have been doing some real evil shit with it, and tells us to give it to her instead. So we head to the ritual site, which is a short but very interesting dungeon, as it's full of large, odd ruins that don't match the surface structures at all. We fight through some swamp mutants, and at the end of the dungeon we find an altar in the Krivbekne itself, a dark, spooky-looking book with a large bloody gash on its cover. I decided to return it to Obadiah to see what would happen, and after giving him the book, he springs up out of his chair and immediately goes downstairs to reveal a secret altar room with a decapitated swamp man on it, and begins praying to the corpse. I tell him that he's above this disgusting display of demonic worship, and he calls me a troglodyte. Now, I can tolerate demonic eldritch worship, but I draw the line at being rude. So I laser his head clean off and take the book back, which I was very pleased to find out that you could actually do. So I head over to Marcello's camp to give her the book instead, but when I show up, I find her dead, as she was attacked and killed by smuggler thugs. From notes in her camp, we learn that the book ties back to the Dunwich building plotline in the base game of Fallout 3, and to take the book to the obelisk there to destroy it, which is a pretty cool tie-in with the base game, and a callback to the overarching Eldritch Lovecraftian subplot Fallout 3 and 4 build-up. It's a short, but very interesting and unique quest, and I always enjoy Bethesda's cosmic horror subplots. They're big Lovecraft fans, and they handle the genre actually pretty well. The other standout side quest is the Chinese Spy Quest, where you can complete a Chinese spy's mission after finding the spy's corpse in the Boardwalk's motel. The quest will have you doing some pretty fun spy activities, such as finding dead drop locations, locating what happened to the previous spy. She, uh, died in a prison camp, if you wanted to know. Locate and blow up a derelict submarine, and punch in a secret code to access a safe room, where you eventually get betrayed on a 200 year delay before escaping. It's a very fun and interesting quest, and works well as a short, but fun, spy themed adventure. Before we head back to the capital wasteland, we run into Nadine in front of the ferry. She tells us that it was Tobar the ferryman who had taken our brains this whole time, as he had worked out a deal with the tribals to perform the brain extraction in exchange for punga fruits to sell across the capital wasteland, and that she was holding him hostage in the ferry's cabin. So we confront him, and he's unrepentant about his actions, and for fucking with my dome, I just destroy his. That couple with the absolute king's ransom he charges for a boat ticket, I'd say this is completely deserved. Earlier I mentioned how Tobar seemed pretty suspicious, and it turns out I have pretty good reason to think that. And his voice performance does a pretty good job of characterizing him as shifty and untrustworthy just through the performance alone. Nadine then takes command of the boat and gives us a free ride back to the capital wasteland, which completes Point Lookout for real. Point Lookout is another really solid DLC package. The main quest, despite being narratively weak, has some pretty engaging and interesting quests, and the new world of Point Lookout, although somewhat desolate and only having a handful of named NPCs, has some really solid theming and a decent amount of interesting locations, some more than others though, and as a setting, it still feels unique for a Fallout game, and having the world be a contiguous and fully open space, and not segmented or linear, does a lot for this DLC. The side quests here are also creative and interesting, and the newly added weapons such as the lever action rifle and the double barrel shotgun work great with the DLC's aesthetics. I can't help but feel like I'm playing a prototype of Far Harbor with this though, but don't worry, that's a great DLC, and this is a pretty damn solid prototype. And with that, we can move on to the final DLC, Mothership Zeta. DLC number 5, Mothership Zeta. Remember in my New Vegas video when I said, We then arrive in Zion, which is probably the most visually unique area out of any Fallout game. Yeah, I think when I was writing that, I totally forgot about this DLC. Mothership Zeta is by far the most out there and detached from the main Fallout locations as you can get. Taking us to an actual alien spacecraft, building off of the long-running alien easter eggs in the Fallout series. In Fallout 1, you can find a crashed alien ship, where one of the aliens has a picture of Elvis in his inventory. The DLC starts when you approach the downed UFO that's in the base game. It's the place where you can find the alien blaster. After approaching the UFO, you're suddenly abducted by a pretty cool looking tractor beam, and you get sucked up into, assumedly, Mothership Zeta. 
There's a brief cutscene where the aliens operate on you, calling back to the classic alien abduction and subsequent probing slash surgery stories that you've probably heard. We then wake up in a cell with another wastelander named Soma, who tells us that we're currently held captive in an alien prison. But not to worry, Soma has a plan for our escape, which is to stage a fight to lure in the alien guards, where we will then overpower them and escape. So we start throwing punches at each other and the plan goes off without a hitch. The guards come in to stop us and we viciously beat them to death and begin our escape. Mothership Zeta is very similar to Operation Anchorage, both being fairly linear, mostly combat focused expansions. Yup, Fallout of Duty is back. <laughs> but this time, with a fresh alien theme. And that theming for the most part works pretty well. The new weapon designs are pretty interesting, albeit functionally no different than any normal human made gun, besides the robot cannon, which launches an energy ball that explodes after a short time having the player having to take physics into account when firing it. But the damage output is kind of weak for a heavy weapon. You're much better off just using the Alien Disintegrator, an Alien-style rifle that does really solid damage and has a massive magazine of 100 shots. And to reload it, just give it a spank on the ass. This gun can pretty much carry you through the entire expansion. But you could also use the Alien Atomizer, a new pistol that's weaker than the original Alien Blaster, which you don't actually get to use until the end of the DLC. But the Atomizer uses the same ammo as the Disintegrator and just does less damage so there's no real reason to not use the Disintegrator at all times. We continue on through the holding cells until we pass by a young girl in a cell, and she tells us to turn off the generator, which is done by pressing the main button to make it show up, then interacting with the three coolant takes surrounding it and waiting for it to blow up. Once that's destroyed, we meet the real MVP of this DLC, Sally. Despite her appearance as a helpless young girl, she seemingly knows the entire layout of the ship, and can crawl through small spaces and open inaccessible doors, and even leads us to the main engine room where she tells us how to shut down all the generators in the three wings of the ship needed to open the way to the next level of the ship. How does she know all of this? Well, apparently, she was abducted shortly after the Great War and has been on the ship for around 200 years, but seemingly hasn't aged since then, so maybe the aliens had her in cold storage for a while. It's way too convenient that she knows this much about the ship, but the narrative of this expansion is in its strong suit, to say the absolute least. I continue on some more and get my gear back and head to the Steamworks, it's here that we really start fighting the enemies of the DLC, the little green men themselves, the Zayden aliens. They look like your typical pop culture alien. Short, big round head, green skin, and big black eyes. Those eyes make them look like they're getting faded on some Zayden za. <laughs> they fight using the aforementioned atomizer, disintegrator, and the shock batons. Some of them will have this rippling, starry looking energy shields that make them harder to kill, and it seems as the DLC goes on, the aliens get stronger by getting stronger shields. You also fight these very Star Wars-y looking robots, turrets, and these taller buffer aliens called Abominations, which through log entries appear to be alien-human hybrid creatures, some sort of alien experiment. You'll also occasionally run into non-hostile alien workers who flee from the player, and you'll actually lose karma if you kill them, which I find odd, as the aliens are pretty much wholly evil towards humans, performing grotesque experiments on them after abducting them from their homes and lives, either killing their human test subjects outright, or worse. And these workers are complicit in that. I always killed them when I saw them, which dropped my karma from very good to just neutral, just for being on some space marine shit. What the hell, man? Once we reach the central engine room, we free four NPCs from cryosleep. A samurai, a cowboy, a soldier from the US Army, and a dead astronaut. This is a pretty awesome narrative development, and there's a ton of potential here for interesting interactions and dialogue. But this is Fallout 3 we're playing, so it's sadly pretty service level. The soldier we save was abducted from the Battle of Anchorage, and there could have been a ton of opportunities for interesting dialogue telling him that the war ended in nuclear devastation and the nation he was fighting for no longer exists. But you don't even get that option. Bro is more concerned with making better alien biogel than having an interesting conversation. But at least the upgraded biogel is pretty helpful. The cowboy, Paulson, doesn't fare much better either. Bro just straight up refuses to chat about most topics. The samurai is my favorite though. He only speaks in Japanese and has a pretty cool set of armor. And since you can't speak to him, he spends most of the DLC running off and doing his own thing. Fun fact, since he's from the Sengoku period of Japan, Toshiro here is canonically the oldest character in the entire Fallout series, being well over 700 years old. From here, we have to destroy three generators that are found in the cryolab, the robot assembly plant, and the hangar. You can take one of the companions to each area for some extra dialogue and interactions, but they're not super important. The combat remains the same throughout the entire DLC, more Fallout of Duty in space, but the designs and interactions of the areas work just enough to keep me from losing interest. There's a decent amount of stuff to see and interact with, especially in the cryolab, is you can open up cryopods to release NPCs, creatures, and mutants throughout the facility. The hangar is the most confusing part of the ship, as it mostly involves interacting with a collection of buttons that trigger repulsor pylons that have a UFO floating within them. I'm not sure why it's set up like this. 
When you try to access the door to blow up the generator, a bunch of aliens will spawn on the other side of the room and run past the pylons, which you can use the buttons to kill the attacking aliens with. It has a weird flow and design to it, and having to walk past it to turn it on and wait for the aliens to assault you. But it's pretty funny to blast their limbs off and watch the ragdolls go flying from the repulsors. Once we've destroyed all three generators, we don the dead astronaut suit and spacewalk out to get to the next level of the ship. This DLC kind of hypes the spacewalk up, but in reality, it's just a short walk on top of the ship. You interact with a few raised power panels, and you're golden. No need to worry about floating off into the vast emptiness of space. It seems gravity still works outside of the ship. We then enter the second level and teleport all my chums onto the next floor with me. We reach an observation deck where we can look down at the Earth that is tinted a yucky green, just like the base game, and has a massive glowing spot on its surface. I wonder what that's about. It's here where I ran into a game-breaking bug where Sally and the rest of the NPCs got stuck on the observation deck, and she refused to move to go into the crawl space nearby to open the door. So I had a console command the door open to continue, which is not a super big deal, but it seemingly broke Sally's dialogue until the end of the DLC, so I may have missed out on some extra story and important dialogue, but I highly doubt it. The second deck of the ship is still more of the same, blasting aliens and robots in enclosed spaces, but now we're scrapping with the Abomination Aliens, whose designs I really like. The expressionless faces and the way they just point at you when spotted makes them pretty freaky to look at, and they have some decent lore to them from the captives logs we get from alien terminals. All these recordings are pretty great, some having pretty funny characters reacting to their abductions, and some having pretty harrowing recordings of people being viciously maimed and experimented on, and the voice acting on these recordings are really well done, and they're all really fun to listen to. I eventually stumble into the death ray room, which you can actually point at and shoot the earth with, but this doesn't actually appear to do anything back in the overworld, so maybe it's a remnant of some cut content or something along those lines. Because we destroy the death ray in this room, but at the end of the DLC, we use the death ray to fight against the enemy ship in the final battle, and it seems perfectly functional there. If I had to guess, the death ray probably played a bigger role in early stages of development, and maybe you could make an evil choice to blast the earth with the death ray, which would cause some sort of change in the overworld, like a settlement getting destroyed or something similar. But who knows? After destroying the death ray, I continue towards the bridge and take on the captain of the ship, who I kill in one shot to the back of the dome before he can even get out of his captain's chair. Oof, it's a tough break. Once the aliens on the bridge are dead, I teleport the rest of my crew to the cockpit, and we get a transmission from an alien hologram before another ship flies out in front of us. We then have to engage in it in space combat. Fucking sweet, right? WRONG! This space battle is very disappointing, being a glorified version of that nonsensical puzzle you have to do in Skyrim to get the Elder Scroll from Blackreach. You fight using only three buttons, which will either set your ship to have full shields and low laser, mid shield and mid laser, or low shield and full laser. I wasn't sure what the strategy was supposed to be, but the power routing buttons can be pressed without any cooldown, so I would set laser to full, shoot it, then set shield to full and wait for the other ship to fire back, and rinse and repeat until the other ship is cooked. Once the ship is destroyed, that concludes Mothership Zeta. The NPCs you helped will be thankful, but they don't have much to do beyond this point. They will either just stay on the ship, or ditch you and vanish into the wasteland, never to be seen again. I'm not sure how Sally's story ends, as she seemingly vanished from the cockpit as soon as the battle was over. So I take the teleporter back to the capital wasteland, and her main reward is a unique alien blaster called the Captain's Sidearm, that shoots out multiple alien blasts at once. It's alright. You can also return to the mothership at any time, but it's kinda pointless, as the NPCs don't have much to say to you, and most of the ship is just inaccessible. Overall, Mothership Zeta's design, areas, and unique setting really save it from being another Operation Anchorage for me. The story is very basic and disappointing. It has some good ideas and interesting developments, but they don't really go anywhere interesting, and we don't learn anything about the Zaden aliens. We don't know anything about their motives, goals, or society, and we come out of it only knowing a small bit more than we knew going in. The combat is pretty basic, just shooting up aliens and robots all day, the disintegrator being more than enough for any situation the DLC throws at you, and some of the mechanics like the hangar repulsors and the final battle aren't very well communicated to the player. Your enjoyment will come down to how well you like Fallout 3's combat, and how much you enjoy the alien setting, which does work pretty well, despite the pretty mediocre gameplay. And with that, that's all the Fallout 3 DLCs complete. You already know what's next, so let's jump right in. In fifth place in the worst DLC of the pack, we got... Operation Anchorage. It's just far and away the weakest expansion of the bunch. It's got restrictive gameplay even for a Fallout of Duty expansion, an almost non-existent story, shallow systems like the squad building, and a very short main quest. The interesting concept and the setting of an Anchorage simulation do a lot of good for it, but outside of that and the sweet reward of the winterized power armor, this DLC's package is lacking. 
and probably the worst non-workshop Fallout DLC. In fourth place, we got Mothership Zeta. It's definitely a step up from Operation Anchorage with a less restrictive gameplay and very unique and creative setting of an alien ship and its varying facilities. I appreciate the move by the Bethesda just to say fuck it and go into space on a journey to shoot the heads off little green aliens. But outside of these factors, this DLC remains a narratively shallow and uncompelling Fallout of Duty style DLC where you're mostly just mowing down aliens in spaceship corridors. That coupled with some game breaking bugs and surprisingly weak characters forced me to put it at the fourth spot. In third place we got Broken Steel. It's just the best out of the three Fallout of Duty expansions. It has some pretty bombastic set pieces and some pretty challenging combat that kept me locked in. This broken steel throws the toughest encounters Fallout 3 has at you, and I had to get crafty a few times to progress, which is pretty rare and very appreciated. It makes a lot of good changes to the base game with the expanded story and post-project purity world updates. Self-inflicted issues, mind you, but still much needed fixes nonetheless. It has the best story of all the previous DLCs, but that isn't really saying much. And outside of Liberty Prime getting destroyed, the story remains a pretty tenseless enclave spanking session. And the lack of Enclave NPCs or expanded lore for their faction really just waters down the conflict to be a simple good versus evil battle. But overall, a fairly sturdy Fallout 3 DLC that does much more good than bad. And in second place, we got... The Pit. It's just an extremely solid DLC that's almost a great DLC, if only we were a bit bigger and a bit deeper. The Pit itself has an excellent design and atmosphere. The artists and designers were cooking on this. You can really feel the filth and hopelessness of the place just through the characters' appearances alone. They must really hate Pittsburgh to make it such a hellhole. The story has a very compelling setup and some tough choices to make. Even though I find the main choices to still be pretty binary overall, despite having some gray area to the consequences of the choices, I found it still mostly just boils down to if you can condone slavery or not. The Steelyard is in a pretty expansive and dangerous place to explore, even if you don't want to grab all 100 ingots. And even though the main quest is still fairly short, all the missions manage to stay fun and engaging throughout, with a decent variety of quest types. If the pit's map was fully contiguous and not segmented, it could have easily taken the top spot over the only DLC that does, which is... First place we got... Point Lookout! It's just the most complete DLC package of the entire group. Although Point Lookout isn't as interesting as an alien spaceship or the hellish ruins of Pittsburgh, it still manages to stand out as a unique setting in the Fallout series. And although a bit overdone at times, the swamps and beaches of Point Lookout are pretty good at nailing down that creepy, mysterious, desolate vibe they're going for. The main quest, although being a letdown narratively speaking, has some engaging quests, especially the Mansion Siege and the Punga Geek Session, and the side quests present here are some of the most fun bits of side content in all of Fallout 3. The Black Hall Manor quest even ties back to the main game and the overarching cosmic horror subplot, which is super cool. Point Lookout just has the most to see and do, and my pick for the best Fallout 3 DLC. And that's every Fallout 3 DLC ranked, and every Fallout DLC ranked. I think next I'll have to combine all my fall videos into one mega 3 hour video or something and rank them all against each other at the end. I'd love to hear your guys opinions on this. Fall 3 is one of the more divisive games out there, so I'd love to see how other people rank these DLCs and what they think of them. And I uh, thank you again for watching very much. Another full hour of this Fallout slop, you know, we love it though. And just like I love you, I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.